Hello, my name is Ricky Gard Diamond, and I want to welcome you to the presentation titled Working Our Way Out of the She Session Creating an Economy of Our Own. Thank you so much for finding time in your life, and thank you to our partners, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, for inviting us here to meet you. WILT has been connecting human rights and economic justice to the quest for peace since 1915. An economy of our own began only last year and would never have gotten this far without WILT's vigorous support, especially your Issues Committee, Women, Money and Democracy headed by Mary Beth Gardam, who's on our advisory board. She and I are going to come out from behind this wizard's curtain along with uh, Carmen Rio soon to answer questions and talk with you. But you're wondering why did Wilt partner with a feminist economic organization? Well, both our organizations see the way a ruthless capitalism grows more ruthless to the benefit of a few whose wealth is made only of paper and often of fraud. We could measure our nation's success by how well we lift everyone up, but only if we organize to show how and demand it. That takes education in a realm that some women find boring or intimidating. We're determined to change that. So let's start. First, we want to acknowledge what is seldom talked about in economic circles. Women did not invent this economy or its tools or rules. The patriarchy did. Our economy is the product of a man-to-man -man discourse that is about 2,400 years old. That's when this word oikonomia was coined by the Greeks. It meant household management because the economy functioned exclusively there that long ago. But today, the patriarchy's popular story of economics looks like the image on the right. There are no women anywhere in money's evolution, at least as some men tell it. Here is a bigger gendered story. Consider these three stages in Homo sapiens uh, economy. Paleolithic Venus of Willendorf was carved with stone tools from a woolly mammoth tusk 30,000 years ago during the ice age. So apparently we were important. Neolithic Ceres holding a leaf, a sheaf of wheat here was goddess to the Romans. As the climate warmed up 12,000 years ago, women began planting seeds. And here is modern liberty. Not even 250 years ago, the colony's richest men declared independence from King George while holding slaves, killing natives and marrying women under whose rights and property, whose rights and property became his under common law. Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations that same year, 1776, founding modern economics. A hundred years later, and all women had gotten for their trouble was this statue. Now, consider women's economic contributions. Women first twisted fibers into thread and cordage, wove carrier bags for babies and gathering food, invented looms with stone weights for weaving cloth. Imagine the ice age without that technology. This is an outdoor oven. Women's agriculture led to her firing clay pottery to store surplus food and bake bread about 8,000 years ago. The patriarchy's wars date back only 5,000 years. And I find that something of a comfort, oikonomia even younger. Very recent is men's industrial revolution fueled by burning coal and oil. This labor-saving circular saw was invented by Tabitha Babbitt who attached it to her spinning wheel. By then, men had mechanized women's textiles and were cooking food in tin cans, getting rich by transforming female producers into what they call consumers. The key takeaway here, women were the first property. 
our reproductive powers and labor controlled by force, law, religion, and custom as wives, concubines, and slaves. The past 5,000 years were the foundation of every so-called civilization and its wealth. Rape and control of women's bodies is still weaponized and used to devalue us. Wives, concubines, and slaves competing for male-controlled survival cast a long shadow. Let's think about recent history. This is a picture of world famous contralto singer Marian Anderson in 1939, giving a famous concert at the Lincoln Memorial. She's outdoors because she'd been denied a concert, concert at Constitution Hall. Her race was the reason the hall's owners were the daughters of the American Revolution. Not the daughters of the Confederacy, mind you, the white New England Mayflower daughters, and despite the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 19th Amendments to the Constitution by then. Now citizens, no longer property, women's hard-won rights remain intersectional. Systemic racism carried a cost to us women. Divided, our voting rights are a question today, and so is our right to choose motherhood or not. We need to confront our whole history. First women, Black and white, won education that had been denied them, but the property rights we later won were right white. Racial divisions separated women to the advantage of the patriarchy. So why do I say that? Well, this image is from my lifetime, the 60s, very, very recent. You've seen this world on Mad Men. It still appears to be the ideal of evangelicals and the Republican Party. No self-respecting Black woman, Latina, or lesbian would put up with this, and neither did any of the women who began the second wave of feminism. And yet, Systemic sexism and systemic racism still divide and conquer. And here's what I mean. First, white women gained rights to vote as citizens, but because she didn't support her darker skinned sisters, it took another 45 years for them to vote. And now today, after so much progress for so many, we're all threatened with losing hard won rights, including our new economic status. Here is the latest census figures on wealth by racial group. Now wealth isn't just our paychecks, it's our, our property. This is family wealth, not individual income. So can you guess which amounts apply to white, Latina, and Black households? Yes, white families have 10 times the wealth of Black families, nearly that of brown Latina families. When we allow ourselves to be divided like this, who wins? Not women, not most of us. None of these numbers is very large in the big picture of millionaires, billionaires, and now trillions in budgets. If you think we've outgrown that man at ease in this picture, take a look at this guy. We haven't, he's still with us. This is Blaise Bernays, a character that cartoonist Pico Todd and I invented for my book, Screwnomics, How the Economy Works Against Women and Real Ways to Make Lasting Change. Screwnomics is my word for Economan's unspoken but widely applied economic theory, I guess, that women should always work for less or even better for free. It's like he believes women are still his property somehow. Economics, banking, and money remains a man's world. And the bigger the pile of money, the fewer women you're going to see. Women won the right to open a bank account without their father or their husband co-signing with them in 1974. Yes, that recent. And today they work in banks. They might even manage a bank but money still speaks in a male voice. The rules and tools remain his. Look at New York stock markets trading floor and Wall Street. Yes, 
Janet Yellen became the 15th head of the Federal Reserve in 2014 and now heads the Treasury. But is it progress or camouflage? I wonder. Our present world of money is still owned by men of a particular race, a particular class, a particular Ivy League education that assumes his right to profit no matter who pays. His bro world and his backroom enterprises are sometimes criminal, but he rarely pays a price. If he crashes the economy, he and Janet are going to survive nicely. You and I won't be so lucky. Now, your father or son or brother might work in this money world, and he's not the econo man I'm talking about in Scronomics, because econo man is a mythical ideal that you and the men you love need to be wary of because he's not good for any of us. Like new corporations today, he's a charming narcissistic sociopath. Now back in 1929, the British writer Virginia Woolf advised a younger woman writer what she needed to think her own thoughts and find her own voice. She needed an income and a room of her own. It became a famous feminist essay. So tired of decades of talk about pay equity, I founded an educational nonprofit alliance of women economic activists with a similar idea. We believe women also need an economy of our own. The patriarchy's economy competes in constant war. Its winners require a great many losers. It's wrong-headed thinking. As I said, I'm not an economist. Trained in language and literature, I studied Economan's words. I wrote Scronomics and won some awards and medals from the National Newspapers Association and the Indie Book Publishers for women's issues and investigative reporting. They cited my unusual sources, but they weren't unusual. They were women who rejected injustice and business as usual. Like our foremothers, they were innovators. You can go to our webpage to learn more about the women activists on our advisory board. They're all terrific. Most are associated with innovative organizations founded by women like Jane Addams in the case of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom or WILF and often to create women-centered solutions. Our purpose at AEOO is to lift up economic solutions that women are already doing. How could we make them more widely recognized and create a kind of economic think tank, a platform and a megaphone? Supposedly, women would rather talk about death than money, but we women, Believe women are discouraged from thinking and talking about economics. We're building a widening community of women who support one another in women's ways of learning about economic issues. We intend to raise a chorus of voices together instead of each woman being another Cassandra at Troy warning of disaster. We have to be listened to this time. An economy of our own planned to go public with an event last summer, and then COVID happened. Our plans went out the window, the way they probably did for you too, right? So what could we do? Well, we created a Zoom of our own. We put smart women together to talk about economics and connections they saw despite their different interests and their intersectional experiences. Diversity was essential. Now, I know you can't read these slides, but we talked about cooperative ownership of businesses and publicly owned banks. We talked about the GDP and it's making caring and visible and the need for vital new measures like the social wealth index. We envisioned a future with living wages, childcare and education, local farming and food security. We talked about rethinking money's purpose who controls our currency and collaborative investments, whether private or public, instead of current gambling and gaming. We tackled the climate crisis and the need for circular economic models that mimic natural cycles. 
You can find these talks and their definitions and resources on our webpage, which has links to An Economy of Our Own's YouTube channel and our blog at Medium. Planning to share with you, we wondered if we'd find patterns in these first conversations. Are there distinctive women's ways of knowing money and our economy? Our underlying mega question at an economy of our own is this one. How do we transform an economy waged as war into an economy waged as life? So we pieced together a quilt from these talks. You'll meet some advisory board members, including Carmen Rios and Jumpa Bhattacharya, Jamila Medley and Rianne Eisler. But you'll also meet Farah Tanis from Black Women's Blueprint, Ebony Perkins from Self-Help Credit Union, Kara Jabola Carolas from the Commission on Women in Hawaii, Sabine O'Hara from the University of District of Columbia, and Victoria Soto de Francesca from the LBJ Center at the University of Texas, and, and many more. When the film, Let's Talk About Building an Economy of Our Own begins, you're gonna hear the great cultural historian and author of Chalice and the Blade and the Real Wealth of Nations, Rianne Eisler, ask me why we hear so little about women's innovations and my own exclamation. So we're gonna show you the film here. Ellen is going to uh, share the screen. Thank you, the Ellen. The problem, Ricky, is if you look at the academic conversation, if you look at the mainstream, economic and political conversation. Where is that history? In the media, why aren't we hearing about these things? Up to us now, isn't it? And that's Money talks in a male voice. We trust each woman's identity is shaped and strengthened by discovery of her own economic truth. Being in community is completely different than being on your own as an individual. I grew up middle class in a majority black poor and working class neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. And my church home was one that embraced liberation theology and exercised it through cooperative economic activities related, um, as I remember them, to, um, to real estate. My grandmother sent a very clear message mm -hmm. that in order to take care of myself, um, I had to be able to provide for myself and to provide for my families. And I was only in elementary school when these things were happening, but I remember keenly um, seeing significant life transitions happen for my friends that were moving from um, public housing projects to single family homes through this understanding that um, pooling resources can lift us all up. It goes all the way back to my great grandmother, um, a, a woman who passed before my existence, but I, I heard the stories and, and know of her and her caregiving work and um, how that transformed into my grandmother and it transferred into my mother. So, you know, I was always told, you're not gonna do this work. <laughs> you're gonna go to school, you're gonna do um, something else. And, and they were just so adamant about it because it was totally uh, unappreciated and underpaid work. The more I looked at how unresilient our healthcare system is, the more I realized that um, that economics was behind that, and it was like, what are we, what are we spending our money on? What are we, um, what are we putting our trust in financially? There's a lot of interesting shifts that are taking place in reshaping how we think about food, our relationship to food, and the support for farmers, especially um, related to small regional farmers, um, and a lot of them are impacted by a lack of childcare as well. So there's a lot of ties back between women in the workplace, especially related to our food system. What really drew me to this work was um, I was pregnant when uh, Trump uh, was elected. I was a parent of a premature, of that premature infant at the first women's march. Um, and that just made a huge impact on me, seeing the anger all around me compared with the isolation that I was feeling at home. It really made me think, like, how am I living my values? We look at solidarity economy and we go back to sort of the tradition that many of us 
you know, know that we come from, right? The traditions that many of us have either come to this country with or that have been sort of like, um, that our ancestors and our families have been steeped in, but that we forget because we have to fit into a particular style of, of economic uh, 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 justice. I found that um, cooperative economics and its expression through the co-op business model gave me access to an opportunity to support folks in expressing their own self in community determination efforts. Um, I'm calling in from the Headwaters Garden and Learning Center, actually, which is an eco-village I founded back in 2009. We are based on permaculture, regenerative principles, like my family's from the Philippines, like I mentioned, and we had 500 years of colonization. So women haven't been free, not to romanticize, you know, the social relations of 500 years ago either. But women haven't been free for a very long time. It's different in Hawaii, you know, just 200, you know, less than 200 years ago. I mean, women and their families still have memories of what it was like to be much freer than it is today and have a, a society that, you know, the myth of bartering, it wasn't transactional. It was a gift economy. Um, and it was about community care. Uh, we've built it as a community land trust so that it's permanently affordable housing for people who are everyday Vermonters. It's not a gated community for the 1%, which is a lot of what happens to intentional communities in Vermont. People are fed up. And when people think about the economy that they want, I bet it's more fair. I bet it's more just. I bet it's probably more democratic. These aren't new ideas <laughs> um, and they're not disconnected from the ways in which people are already practicing economy in their own lives. What would our healthcare system look like? And I also say, what would our agricultural system look like? Mm. If science hadn't been concentrated in this way, if it had also been developed over time by indigenous people, by women, by black and brown people, by working class people. and I say there, we don't know, but one thing we do know is not like this. If you think of our political, economic, of our worldview, it really marginalizes our conventional categories, right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, our studies of economics, our studies of society, they either marginalize or ignore the majority of humanity women and children. That is crazy and we need to stand reality right side up. So moms, moms especially now need to be considered essential workers, right? Earth's ecosystems, they're overloaded. We've overloaded them and so now we're reaping uh, this, this uh, you know, the results of not understanding that economics is not only about sources, about resources feeding the economy, but it's also about things absorbing the leftovers. Where do they get processed? How do you even be, start to think about self-sufficiency when you're dealing with intergenerational trauma and when there are no resources to heal from that so that we can flourish and so that we can be at the table, so that we can have a voice and actually achieve, you know, all of these amazing things that we're expected to achieve that you know we're said that we are owed in this uh, uh, country of of uh, you know liberty and freedom, etc. Seeing capacities are exhausted and people and overloaded, right? And it's women who have historically they've contributed to that work. If if you don't get fed, if you don't sleep, if you don't get loved, where's your productivity going to come from to go to work the next day? It's not going to happen. We went around the room, what does poverty mean to you? And our answers range from having to engage in survival sex. That's what poverty means to me. Um, suffering with a broken arm without accessing the hospital because I was undocumented. That's what poverty means to me. To not being able to get basic items like tampons and pads because they're so expensive. And so I have to use toilet paper and wads of paper towel. That's what poverty means to me. A lot of the reason why women feel intimidated um, with investments and finance in general is because of the lingo. 
And because of, I, I often say that there is a language barrier. There's an assumption that everybody in the room knows so much more than you do. Um, you're the dumbest one. You don't want to bring it up because like you said, you may come across as if you're stupid and you're less informed. And that's the last thing you want to do. You feel like you're carrying the weight of all women on your shoulders. The secret that I learned, and it took me a long time to get to this because I felt the same way for so long, for so long. And then I realized they don't know what they're talking about either. I really come to this not as an expert on uh, public banking or cooperatives, but um, as an expert in really understanding that the way our economy is set up right now simply was not built to uplift uh, women, in particularly Black women, so I'm bringing an intersectional lens into this discussion, um, and that we need to come up with alternative solutions, and not even just, I mean, I love this frame of an economy of our, own, of our own, but I'd also like to push us further to say that the economy writ large, which we have control over, right, the economy is made from rules that we put out there. It's not its own natural thing, right? We control the economy. We are the economy. What I learned is how much privilege I have and how much more care work people are doing than I am and with how much less help. And that's really started to make me inspired uh, to start organizing parents and thinking about if parents organized as a workforce, if we thought of ourselves as workers who are unwaged. We need economic structures and systems that actually uplift women. The carbon cycle that regulates our climate isn't just about fossil fuels and CO2. The carbon cycle is the unfolding of creation itself. It involves every living thing in the past, present, and future, from the tiniest organisms at the bottom of the ocean to our heartbeats. Any real solutions, therefore, will have to include all the aspects. On the one hand, that may seem like a daunting task, but on the other hand, it means that any lasting solution is likely to help solve the whole thing. Our work really centers around looking at wealth as the economic North Star, because um, you know there's income. Um, income is a part of your wealth, and we think wealth is a North Star because wealth, while we're living in a capitalist society, is what affords you power, right? And it's a, it's a, what affords you dignity. It's what allows choice. The 99%, if we get together and if we communicate and work together, we can beat the 1%. I mean, we've got the numbers. They've got the money, but we've got the numbers. The aim of our whole, our whole plan was how do we use this moment, not just to stimulate jobs or, you know, get women into the green infrastructure that's, you know, around a Green New Deal or what have you, but even bigger than that, completely shift the value system. We can actually back out of the carbon mess that we're in because of the fact that new and organic and regenerative forms of agriculture actually help pull carbon out of the atmosphere. So that's why I went and started what we're calling the regeneration revolution. And I think that we also have to understand that domination economics is bad for everyone, women, men, and children. Domination systems are trauma factories. We're witnessing the side effects of what colonization has done to a place. Um, you know, I, I, I say often, you know, in introducing myself that I live in Cancer Alley, just north of the dead zone. Mm -hmm. um, and that being this legacy of, uh, yeah, plantation society and petrochemical um, industrial um, <laughs> I don't even have All words. It. It's really yucko. Um, but I'm really uh, super excited and honored in spite of all the darkness. Women are organizing around uh, an analysis of feminism that's decolonial and that is rooted in a completely different value system. Rich meaning legacy, a legacy of liberation, right? And a legacy of looking at the world differently and living differently and ensuring safety, dignity, economic security, et cetera, et cetera. All the things we know we want. Deep in our gut, we know we want it. But looking at the world through the female lens, if you will, is one of the key ways, I think, to address some of the 
real serious problems we've got. If we're going to think about the future, it doesn't need to be just about addressing the problems. It needs to be what is that that focus? What are the values that we want to see moving forward and really getting to those, not just fixating on where the problems and where it's broken. We know that the traditional financial systems, so traditional banks in particular, right, um, are just are continuously finding ways to extract wealth um, from people of color and women in America. So uh, it's really intriguing to me to have alternative systems again and design them and implement them in a way that actually centers black women because um, that is the polar opposite of what we have right now. My definition of leadership is um, is someone who's working to make things go well around them, whether their efforts are recognized or not. So the second part of that question is, is where and how are women leading in the project, whether their work is recognized or not. And for those of us who don't have a chair, we're going to have to create our own tables. Or we're going to have to create a circle and sit on the ground and say, this is the table. We've named that this is the table. Let's all sit around that table. If you think about what a regenerative economy would be, it's fundamentally female. Talking about making an immediate change of divesting from this huge system is, is really scary for people. If there's a comfort in it. There's a knowledge about how it operates, sort of. Um, kind of a knowledge of what they're doing. A key puzzle piece fell into place when I learned that the money we use every day is created and extinguished by bank lending. Commercial banks, I was amazed to find out, not only collect interest on every dollar that passes through my hands, they are the deciders about who can borrow how much new bank credit based on one intention, which is to build their own power. Or I had always been interested in the fact that banks, not governments, actually create our money. We need permanent, stable value, just money controlled by a truly representative government. It's one of the key ways we could make the economy more like nature is to have an ecology of currencies instead of the monoculture monetary system we have, because it really is the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's a very male institution. It's very yang. And um, it's driving a lot of the decisions that are driving us to this eventuality. Folks who are interested in solidarity economy need to begin talking more about it, need to begin to frame it as an alternative, need to begin to frame it as what can be the new sort of normal, because it was happening. It's been normal to many of us. Yeah. Can we frame it as what can be the new normal? Each time, um, people organize. We're in this moment now where there's socioeconomic and political unrest. And so people are turning to collective and cooperative economic practices to meet their needs because no one is coming to save us. But you can bet that there will be resistance to that from the establishment. And so in order for us to really move, we have to strengthen our associations of people who are doing this work together. I, I hate to say it, but politics and policy is slow and it takes some patience, but we just got to keep, you know, ramming at that door to get what we need for, for the sustaining, you know, a sustaining environment for our most vulnerable women. We need to work together to create pathways to get back home and also knowing that our home places are um, up against, you know, these rising waters and these cycles of storms. And so how can we um, think of our garden network as one body? We're so used to being on the defensive and constantly being reactive to all the crap that's being put down. Um, we don't get a chance to vision and be proactive and talk about like what is the society we want to create and then what are the institutions that will get us there. And when you have that conversation with people, they are talking about community. They are talking about shared prosperity. They are talking about abundance, right? They are talking about um, understanding how we are all interconnected to one another, that our fates are intertwined. I hope you noticed what we saw. We believe that women 
united across intersections are the largest group likeliest to claim a living economy as our own. So feminist economics are, are not just for women. We'll be continuing Zoom of our own conversations and we'd love to hear from you about women you've noticed and admire, solutions you, you care about, and economic topics you'd like to understand better. Because while feminist economics are good for all of us, our mission is focused on empowering you, which is why we're working with our partners and experienced activists to develop what we're calling learning circles, more in-depth women's study groups on subjects we only introduced in our Zooms. We're beginning with a solution that we believe has potential for dramatically changing our economic world, one that Wall Street doesn't like, and one that we won't win without further women's, more women's support. If you think escrow is a salad green, then it's time to register for our public banking learning circle. Chances are you may not know how public banking can save the planet, close the equity gap, address systemic racism, finance education, and level the playing field for women and families. It's no coincidence that the one state with a public bank in the United States, North Dakota, not only weathered 2008's financial crash, but had a surplus in their state budget in 2009 because of their 100 year old state owned bank. So you can learn more about what makes public banks different, why it matters to your community and how you can become a skilled and competent advocate. Our Zoom series of six meetings is gonna kick off on Friday, August 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern, and it's gonna go through the fall. Registration is limited this first time to just 20. So register at our website as soon as you can. So there's much more to do. <clears throat> we need to invest in what women are told Americans cannot afford. When you compare the United States with other developed nations, our support for women and families is truly pathetic. But here's what we know. <sighs> Money is not our measure. And we also know our real wealth is our creativity and our relationships. Now, AEOO has three goals described in detail on our webpage with descriptions of how to finance policies we recommend. And I'm gonna to touch on them briefly here. This is the, this invest in peaceable livable lives is the time of our lives. We need to challenge why the old 40 hour work week standard to support a family is now 80 to 100 hours. We need a social wealth index to make family, community, and environmental care visible as the best way to ensure economic well being. We need pay equity, a $15 minimum wage, but why stop there? We want a 30 hour work week standard for 40 hours pay. Now, if that sounds crazy to you, Iceland is already experimenting, and no coincidence, they've had many female prime ministers and many female legislators. Technology has increased our efficiency as it always has. And this digital technology should grant us not just billionaires, but ample family leave time and universal vacations for our rest and our renewal. Our second goal, of course, we need to shift from fossil fuel to a green new deal publicly financed. Health care and child care for all is the real bottom line for sustainability. And finally, we need to invest in universal basic needs. The richest nation on earth can afford housing, education, safe local farming, food, water and waste systems, roads, and bridges and capital for small businesses. Our lack comes from this economy's purpose. Every political issue today is really economics and who gets to decide, money kings or the people, and including women of all races this time. While we are on 
waging life on Main Street uh, for our health and our happiness. Wall Street is still waging economic war for global domination. That's a fool's goal. With our forests burning, our seas rising, and a deadly virus mutating. Crashing economics bro culture, women are delivering macroeconomic policies for fair trade, fair taxes, debt-free currencies, and an end to corporate personhood with a bought and paid for political system. You can learn more about all this on our webpage and those of our partners, their organizations link there too. Now, if all of this sounds too hard, I want you to remember the energy and the excitement of that amazing 2017 Women's March all across the nation and the ones that followed. Each of us really need only take our own small steps to make it a movement. Remember too, the female that all of us depend on, our mother earth, she needs rights and protection against violence too. Yeah, so in women we trust, and there, there's another asterisk here and it's for the men who love us. We know there are many of you, yet, too many still find it hard to respect women's leadership, women's voices, and women's ways of knowing, especially in the world of money. Women's leadership is and must be different and as innovative and all in as our foremothers first twisting fibers together or first planting seeds or reinventing what has been cast aside as old fashioned. We need something fast and circular to cut through old ways of thinking about money and livelihoods and each other. So please join our movement, stay in touch. There's lots of ways to do that. Our webpage, our social media, our newsletter, our giving circle. You can register for a Zoom of your own or a learning circle and send us your suggestions. Thanks again for this time to share with you so let's stop the slideshow now and we'll welcome your questions and your comments in just a moment. We're going to talk woman to woman economics. Thanks again.